Hey, what's going on, everybody? This is your boy, Jay Mason. Welcome to another episode of Beyond the Album Cover, where we get inside the entertainment industry with those in the know and give them their flowers. Why are they here to be celebrated? With me right now, I have a pop reggae dance hall artist based out of NY that's currently doing his thing. He put out a record a couple of weeks ago called Move Don't Stop, Very High Energy. And if you ever see this man perform, just know that you're going to be in for a show. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a big round of applause for Mr. Damian Anthony for coming on Beyond the Album Cover. Welcome. How are you? How are you? Good evening. Good afternoon. And good night for those that are, you know, all over the world. All right. There's <laughs> always I night somewhere. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate you coming on the podcast. So let's just go ahead and just jump right into it. So in reading your bio, you were born in Kingston, Jamaica, but raised in the BX and the Bronx. So what was that like having that mixture of both worlds being uh, born in Jamaica, but raised in New York and just knowing how big the influence of Caribbean music played in world music and especially in New York with the Burgoyne hip hop scene when hip hop was just coming into form? Wow. That's a lot to unfold. Um, it it was a it was, it was it wasn't so much of a transition. It was just you just hop from one thing to the next, really. You know, like I have genres of music. I just you know in the household because of the culture, listen to what I listen to here because it came naturally because that's what we were embedded in. And then I found my way into the hip hop culture, you know, through the '90s and 2000s, due to you know the beginning of of the internet and social media more so because I was kind of into R&B growing up, you know, hip hop, you know, I, when I was growing up, you know, there was a Tupac and a Biggie, but it wasn't so prevalent until I got to, you know, get into cable vision and got into the MTV culture and into the BET culture. And then, you know, I listened to Hot 97 a lot, but it never really dawned on me until the music videos became more visual and I started getting into it more. And then once I got into it, I just, you know, I dabbled back and forth between the two before I decided to do music. I just kind of was more of a, a fan and a, a spectator than an artist at the time. Mm -hmm. So you say you listened to R&B a lot more before really leaning heavy into the reggae and dancehall. Who were some of your early R&B influences? Wow, well, honestly, because I did listen to pop as well, but honestly, I was, I was listening to Luther Vandross. You know, I was listening to Brian McKnight. You know, I was listening to all the old school Motown artists. You know, I was heavily into Boys to Men. I was, you know, those were the artists that I was listening to at the time. And then, you know, and then there's the mainstream ones as well. You know, I, I we love Celine Dion. You know, then there's the Whitney Houston's and then there's the Patties and the Aretha's. And, you know, because I grew up doing musical theater. I do. I, I was doing off-Broadway shows and musical. So I was into vocalists and, the, and I, I was going to church heavy. So it was gospel. It was a lot of gospel. It was a lot of, you know, vocally, it wasn't so much entertainers. It was more so just vocalists, like actual singers. And then I got into entertainment where the hip hop and the rapping and the, the showmanship started kicking in later on. Right. And it's funny how you mentioned Luther. They just revealed a trailer for the Luther Never Too Much documentary that will be dropping next year. And, you know, a lot of yeah, people yeah. will really get to see just how big of an influence Luther played in the world of music. And before he got to start solely, he sang backgrounds for Bette Midler, oh, okay. David Bowie, any and everybody. And then, of course, once he yeah. took off solo, it was all she wrote. I mean, I wish the man wrote a book just telling telling everything because <laughs> he was behind the scenes. That man was, he was, he was, he's definitely an icon and an idol to me, to be honest with you. One of my top four, I have four top favorite singers, like vocalists, and he's one of the top four. Okay, so you mentioned Luther in your top four singles. Who's the other three? Oof, I'm kind of bad because three out of four of them are no longer here. <laughs> um, it's Luther Vandross, Whitney Houston, Michael Jackson, and Celine Dion. When it comes to vocals, anyway... You know, vocally, you know, and I don't categorize Michael Jackson per se as a um as a vocalist. I know I'm gonna get beat up for saying this. You know, he's to me he's more of an entertainer and a and a and a performance artist, and he does sing very well. But like when I think of vocals, I think of Luther. When I think of an entertainer and performer and singer, I think of Michael Jackson. But I feel like there's a difference between vocalists and actual singers. I feel like when you're a vocalist, you're more top tier than the right. average singer, you know? Right. Now, is there a difference between reggae 
and dance hall? Because I know a lot of people tend to combine the two together now. Yes. Is there a difference? There is a difference. If I can minimize it or layman's term, like if I could make it in the simplicity, reggae is uh, reggae and dance hall. Uh, reggae is more like the equivalent to what I guess I don't want to say is like for example you know there's rap and then there's hip hop mm -hmm. even though hip hop is part of a rap or whatever but it's a little bit more explicit a little bit more you know you know like uh it's like it's kind of like that it's like hip hop and R and B or something like that reggae is more chill cool vibes kumbaya peace loving you know it's 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 a vibe you know it could be the R and B rap vibe or whatever, but dance hall is equivalent to what you could call hip hop, you know, strip clubs, getting the club dirty, shaking that out. Like it, it gets a little bit more explicit. Mm -hmm. It's like a little bit more up there with the, you know, the freaky vibe, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I get what you're saying. Cause you know, a lot of people in the States who are not familiar with the difference between the two tend to put them together in one big bowl. And of course, once Bob Marley hit over here in the U.S. with Exodus and Chris Blackwell signed them, Island, and that really started the explosion of reggae here stateside. And, and again, then, Bob Marley music, it's never, he's not, you know, he's not dancehall. He's very much so reggae, very chill, very, you know, he's a peace-loving. You know, mm -hmm. his music is worldwide and embraced by everybody. And dancehall can be too, and is too, but mm -hmm. dancehall is very much more, you know, I would say equivalent to hip hop, the the rap, the getting it in, you know, the clubs, the that's right. that's what dancehall is more of, in my opinion, anyway. Right, right. And then in the nineties, you had you know Patra, Supercat, D Shaka Plus, Demas, um, and Shaka Ranks, and um, that was where that explosion came in. Then of course, when Caribbean rhythms came on BET, that's when it started introducing a lot of that to an audience who may not have been familiar with that particular style. Yeah, I feel like we still don't have that um platform as strongly as I feel like we deserve, but, you know, hopefully it'll get there. We're just now getting there a little bit more, being that we have in, you know, an actual Caribbean Music Awards, which I hope to be in one day. <laughs> so, But, you know, I feel like, you know, dancehall, reggae is beloved and, and loved worldwide, but dancehall is not is is embraced as I feel like it it should be, mm -hmm. unless it goes mainstream, unless you do a collaboration or infuse it with like a a pop sound. That's why if you did you know a pop fusion with dancehall, but people sometimes will mistake it as Afro beats or something when when it's far from it. Right now, was there one person that really helped put the batter in their back to really pursue music, or did you just have that drive to do it on your own and get it out the mud any means necessary? It's a mixture of both because my family is not, you know, I wouldn't say there's any famous artists or any musicians in my family on my father's side. His sister's a, a gospel artist, uh, rest in peace, she passed away. Sister Sharon Dyer, she has a gospel album. And, you know, a lot of members of my family, they sing and they've done shows and performed, but nobody uh, musically in the industry pursued a career industry-wise. You know, we have authors and people who wrote now books and done things like that. But I, I could honestly say, Aside from now, my cousin who's managing an artist, um, I'm pretty much, you know, one of the only artists in the family that's pursuing a mainstream career. But my influences that really put it in my back was, um, you know, throughout my junior high school, high school years, I joined the choir. I sang in every choir that I can, did shows with them, did off-Broadway musicals and got inspired by the theater world or whatever. But once I got introduced to like MTV and BET and saw like Britney Spears and the the pop explosion and then saw, you know, the hip hop explosion explode even more because of the music videos and everything in the like late 90s, early 2000s. That's when I just really took off, wanted to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. And then with you being, of course, based in uh, New York, you know, with the heavy Caribbean population out there is like you can easily find a lot of influences music wise sound wise just within that sphere but there's a difference because a lot of people tend to lump you know Haitians Jamaican Dominican all in one the, but the they're all Caribbean different was just lumped in a one lump sum true and I, honestly you know growing up like I said I didn't really see that though that's the problem I mean I grew up watching Shaggy and Sean Paul, because they were so famous and went so mainstream, 
that it was impossible to not, you know, see them. But they were like, I don't want to say they were the exception. If you're not embedded in the culture, you won't know who those people are. And because I grew up in the American culture, in the American school system and everything, and I didn't embrace my roots like a native because I didn't grow up there, I didn't really know who who was who unless they made it on mainstream television. So I didn't know that, you know, reggae and dance hall was a big thing worldwide until I had to backpedal and look at it that way. But, you know, even though you, even then you still didn't see them on the everyday show, you didn't see them on the Billboard Awards. You didn't see these artists on the Grammys frequently the way they would have these rappers and hip hop stars at, at, at the awards left and right. So, you know, it wasn't the normal to me, right. but I love the culture behind the scenes. But when you go to the clubs or you on the radio stations late at night in the car and you know, your party and you you hear our music left and right though. But for some reason on television, it, it was just not predominantly there for some reason for the world to really embrace. And, you know, these artists go on tour, they'll be in South America, they'll be in Africa, they'll be in Australia, Europe, Asia. Don't get me wrong, the dancehall artists perform all over, but for some reason, I, I scratch my head when I say this all the time, I just don't see mainstream. Um, I feel like we're like the stepchild of the music industry you don't really see us on the mainstream platforms like the hip hop artists are and our music is equivalent. They curse just as much and talk and say a lot of crazy things or whatever, but they, they, they get that spotlight that reggae artists, I mean, and dancehall artists don't really get. Yeah. So it's still kind of treated more as a niche genre uh, un unless you really get that mainstream pop acceptance, like you mentioned Sean Paul and Shaggy, because you know, when it wasn't me drop, that was a crossover hit and really launched Shaggy into spaces that you normally wouldn't get unless you kind of had that pop sound that appealed to a worldwide mass. Yes, honestly, yes, exactly. So, but with what I do now, I do a fusion and I put my, I put, you know, I put, one sound together and the other sound together and I just try to mash it and try to do it but it's all about it's not just about the music it's about how I perform as well so you know I love to dance and I love to move around and because I did like off-Broadway shows and did a lot of theater programs growing up and so when I perform on stage you know I love the girls can roll around and head top and do all the fun stuff but I love doing choreography because Usher you know Justin Timberlake the boy bands you know like I said Britney, J-Lo, Ciara, Janet, Michael all that influence just made me want to put that in my um, live shows to show that I can, you know, put on a show so you can be entertained by the, you know, the the visuals and the choreography and the costumes and predominantly, obviously, the music it has to be good as well. But no male reggae artist that I know of at the moment, you know, and I love Sean Paul Shaggy, Sean Kingston and everybody that's making it mainstream and that set the tone. And, you know, there's Vibes Cartel, Beanie Man and all, like the list goes on, but they're not performing like, Chris Brown is the usher, you know what I mean? You're not doing choreography like that. So I feel like that's where I kind of stand out, you mm -hmm. know? And so that's when, when I perform, I try to dance and incorporate choreography to the fullest extent. I try to keep up with my dancers just for entertainment purposes anyway. Right. And that what really struck me about you when I saw your performance clips, like how you mentioned, you don't really see that style of dance within the dance hall, reggae world, because you mentioned the pop influence from Usher, Britney, the 92,000 pop explosion, and you took elements of that to put that in a genre that where you don't really see the pop, 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 clean, crisp choreography. Yeah, yeah and, and I love that's it. What I like. and, and, I, and I'm not so, I don't consider myself like a, a dancer, dancer, but, you know, practice makes perfect. And I guess because of the theater training is I'm able to just pick up the steps and just keep up with the dancers. But don't get me wrong, Jamaican artists, they do dance and create trends. And, you know, they do a lot of, you know, especially now with the TikTok dances and a lot of the movements that they do. But particularly me, you know, I, I like those trends and I like those movements. But when I try to do a full on show, I try to do a production show with full routines and choreography in and out throughout the whole entire set where I just feel good dancing and performing and letting the ladies and and the men see that, you know, there's a there's a dude out there just, you know, doing this thing and dancing and performing while he, you know, sings his songs and creates a good vibe and entertainment. Mm -hmm. Now with the choreo, do you come up with the, with your own choreo or do you have someone in addition to you collaborating on the choreo? I, I would say 85 to 90 percent of the choreography I come up with. 
Um, I do it myself because I, you know, I don't consider myself like a, a head choreographer, but you know, when you don't, I'm like, I'm an indie artist. I don't have a budget. I don't have like all the things. I don't have a machine behind me. Well, I didn't at the time. I still don't sort of, but I have more so help and structure now. But at the time it was just guerrilla theater, basically. We just rented spaces. I just came up with ideas, they followed. And then some of them would clean it up and implement some nits and bits. And I do have to say out of fairness, there would be a little, you know, minute collaborations. But the majority of it is just me doing what I gotta do and the dancers just taking it and just, you know, running with it and executing as best as they can. Mm -hmm. Now tell me about the Move Don't Stop record. Move Don't Stop is my first single, actually. I, I wrote the song in 2018. That's how old it is, really. Never, I never put it out there to be honest with you. So I, what I what I did was I found out that um when it came to music, you know, it's very very important to a lot of people. From the research that I did, this was to write your own music. Everybody kept on there was this era, you know, where it's like write your own music, put your pen to work. You know, you'll benefit from writing your own songs. And so I wrote the song, and then I I went on a writing rampage, and then I ended up writing a whole album. And I just wrote all my original music. And then upon writing my music, you know, I then I was like, all right, I need beats to the song. Like, so, I, you know, I went on YouTube, looked up beats. I, I did everything prematurely on my own. I didn't have a team or management. So I just kind of just did research. But then Common Sense kicked in. I'm like, wow, there's like 50,000 people, 200,000 people, 1.5 million people that listen to this beat online. If they rent it or buy it or whatever, I'm going to have a song with the same beat as like maybe 25 people somewhere around the world. So I had to look into uh, getting something exclusive. So I don't rent anything. So everything I did, I had to, you know, I just went back to work. Went to work, saved up my money, and I bought the beats exclusively from the producers where nobody else can have them around the world. They're mine. They're no longer the producers. I don't rent it. I don't lease it. They're not leasing it. They sold it to me. And then I was like, oh, shit, I got to do this to like 15 other songs. So, you know, that's why things took so long. It took me about four or five years because... As the average person living in the Bronx, not making a lot of money, you know, living on the block, you're not making, you know, 60K a year, you're not pulling out bags and everything. So, you know, every little dollar I got, I just put to the side after paying bills and taking care of my responsibilities. I just, you know, respectfully put things aside and bought a beat. Some could be for 500. Some producers charged me 1500 for one for one simple beat, but it was exclusive. So... Now I have all of that stuff in their minds. Like I can resell it, do what I want with it with no consequences. Like masters and everything are all mine. I had to copyright my song, go on government sites to do all these things. Like I just, I realized like I just didn't want to owe anybody anything, make any mistakes or not be locked in properly. Then I found out about ASCAP, BMI, had to become a member. Like I just, I, it took so long because I wanted to safeguard everything. And I, like I said, I didn't have the money and budget, so it just took a while, to be honest with you. Yeah, and that's the beauty of living in the technology age where you can pretty much look up anything and do research on your own, whereas prior to, you almost pretty much had to have an inside connection to know all these things, where now it's right yeah, at I your don't fingertips. Know nobody. Yeah, I didn't know anybody. I, I, got, I, I, built, I built a networking situation because of the shows that I've done. I started off just uh, performing in the parks, you know, community centers. I ended up performing, you know, I, I was at veterans homes, hospitals, went on a little high school tour through, through a sponsorship, did those things. And then upon doing those, I bumped into people. And then for every show, someone was in the audience that liked what they saw, booked me for the next gig. Mm -hmm. And then that's how that happened to the point where I did like 60 shows in one year. But, you know, and then I started being reached out to online and, you know, things got a little bit more more exclusive and better for me. You know, representatives came and wanted to see a rehearsal. They helped me clean up some routines, helped me get certain things together off of the strength of supporting me. You know, no contracts, no nothing. Just, just they just wanted to help me get where I was going out of, you know, out of respect and faith of what I can bring to the table. So mm -hmm. that was pretty much how that worked. Yeah, so it's pretty much with now, you almost have to have a pre-prepared package coming in for somebody to really invest in you. Whereas prior to you got signed to a label and if you were kind of not there yet, they would give you an artist development deal so that you could develop your yeah. craft before. And they don't even do artist development. Yeah. Artist development is going like, I wish they did, but I had to do that myself, but I got lucky with some insiders, you know, shout out to Randy Connor. 
Um, if you don't know who he is, you know, he worked with Aaliyah, Little Kim. He worked with um the list goes on, Salt and Pepper. Um, he spent about two years doing artist development with me during the pandemic, to be honest with you. You know, we were supposed to have some spacing, which we did. We got a big studio, but because everybody had some free time and he had some time on his hands, he invested his time in just overseeing my rehearsals and cleaning up stuff. Uh, if you don't know who he is particularly, he worked with Britney Spears before she came out in um, 1998. He was with her since she was like 14, 15. The label assigned him to her and he was the the mastermind, a young black man who created um uh, the choreography for Hit Me Baby One More Time. That was all his. And, you know, and I'm a big fan of Britney and for him to work with me, who was, you know, who was working with her, it, it just kind of, it felt so right. So that's how I got a little bit more polished you know, and, and, and that that worked pretty well. Yeah, and, and you could tell, you know, when you look at the stage shows and everything that you did it the old-fashioned way where it you really took your time and really developed your craft and, you know, now you, you're on your way. I hope so. I'm still looking for representation. <laughs> it's like the labels don't they see what, what's scary about I wish I was um where I am now in the early 2000s. Because labels would have probably took on to what I was doing. But now you could be amazing and you could be great. But it's like they don't care about this. I don't think it's so much the talent now. It's it's who you know and how much followers you have and how much people you can bring to the table to buy the product or whatever. Whether you're good or not. Like, I'm not here to judge anybody's talent. But mm -hmm. I know this it's a numbers game now rather than a talent game. So you don't have to be a talented singer anymore or a performer anymore. You have to be somebody that comes with numbers or 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 fame or popularity and they'll take you on because they won't lose anything because they know that once they put you out there and back you up, the numbers will grow because you already have that fan base. Yeah, at the so, end of, yeah, I agree. At the end of the day, it's all about what can sell and when it's about the bottom line, you're not really gonna take risk on artists that may not be commercial. But you know that they're going to have that strong, steady fan base. But if they're not going to bring in the money that's going to drive the engine, then you can forget it. Yeah. Um, the only downside to that is most of them are just social media, um, social media, I won't say influencers, but they put, they're just clout for social media because what's going to happen is when it's time for them to perform at these events and do these shows and go on concert and tours and the fans want to see, and the fans want to see them perform live. The fans get disappointed because there was no development behind them. They lackluster on stage. They don't know how to navigate the stage. They don't know how to perform properly. They, you know, they, there's a lot of things that go into, you know, just being an artist. You know, you gotta, uh, you want to hit the road because that's where you make the most money now. It's like you, it's sponsorships and going on tour for the most part and putting on the show. And plus, your fans want to see you. You don't want to be on Instagram all day just doing photo shoots and taking pictures. They want to see you actually perform the songs that they sing along to and relate and enjoy and go to a show to get away from their everyday lives. And that's what I like to do. I feel more comfortable on stage mm -hmm. just to see that person buy a ticket, you know, be excited with a drink in their hand and coming from work, you know, just letting go of whatever problems they got going on and singing something for them is, is it satisfying to me. Yeah, because there's a method to working a stage where it's more than just sitting at the center, moving to the left, moving to the right. You want to use the whole stage. The stage is a canvas. It's not meant for you to just stand in one spot. And there's little nuances that you only pick up when you go through the development and seeing how social media completely upended the music industry and how labels look at what's a quote-unquote star that I think we are slowly but surely losing, you know, those legacy acts, you know, that you see, we just recently lost our Frankie Beverly RIP and how you don't really see acts like that anymore where, you know, for sure you're going to see them out on a tour and they're going to consistently make good money because they have songs that are timeless and a stage yeah. show that is uh, good to boot. You know, and, and like I said, you know, I'm very neutral when it comes to that because it's like I, I talk only based on the 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 gift that I bring to the stage because that's what that's the that's the element and vibe that I do. But there are, like I said, you know, Luther don't need to dance and all these other people don't need to dance. Mariah, they could just have a mic and a stool and still kill it. But the thing is, they still deliver. They went through artist development on knowing how to 
walk across the stage and connect with the audience or whatever. So when I say that, it's not so much that they have to have dancers and perform, but there's like a disconnect, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Like, because they're so used to being on social media and, you know, self-indulging their own, you know, indulgence, basically. When it's time to get in front of a crowd, they don't know how to really connect with the audience when they're trying to put their material out. That, you know, I've been to showcases and, you know, a lot of artists, and I'm not, you know, objective to it, sing along with their tracks or, or you know, yell over it or whatever. But the thing is, it's like, even when they're doing that, the audience is not getting a feel for what they're giving on stage when they do that either, you know? So mm -hmm. I just like to make people smile. I like to put on a show. They'll sit at the edge of their seat. If you're not a big fan of the vocals, you'll be like, you know what? That was really nice. I like the lights and the shows and his dancing and the moving. And that song was catchy. And then, oh, that, or if I do a ballad, they just like the ballad and he stood still and enjoyed himself. Or, you know, it was like, I just, I, either way, I want someone to sit at the edge of their seat and enjoy what they came to see and experience. Mm. What's your favorite part about uh, performing on stage? Being the curiosity on people's faces. It's like, because I tend to look in the audience a lot. And I, you know, because as an unknown artist, when I perform, you know, when I go to showcases, I know that I notice if they don't know you or you come with a crowd, they don't really pay attention to you at all. It's like, you know, they, you have you have about maybe 20 to 30 seconds to get a hold of them. And then that's it. But I noticed when I perform on stage, even though people never heard of me or saw me before, they stick through the entire song. So I know I have something to bring to the table. And if I didn't have something behind me, you know, or people that can push me, whether it be an A and R or official management and things like that, then you know, everything is to the moon and to the stars. So fingers crossed. Yeah, so it's almost as if because of the dwindling attention span of people that if you're performing, you got to grab them right as soon as you come on. Yeah, and because I bring that old school dynamic of performances back to the stage, it's very rare to see that nowadays. So because they don't see that nowadays, I become the unique situation now. And that's why I like what I'm doing with the pop and dance or fusion because one, you don't see a Caribbean artist performing on that level. Like, like you know, Jamaica doesn't have their own version of Usher or Chris Brown or Jason Derulo. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. they don't have that male artist that's doing that. You know, it's, sometimes it could be a little cliche or they might think it's a little, you know, I have no disrespect. They could think it's a little, like, gay or something, however they want to call it. They don't, you know, men don't do that in that culture per se. You know, they do some, you know, some some steps and some bad boy moves and some, you know, stuff like that. But to to do all that pop, 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 boy band routine type stuff, they don't, it doesn't, it's not a good visual that they could put together with a dancehall style artist. Some people don't even consider me dancehall. They don't, they don't hear it or see it particularly. And some people do. So, you know, it's, it's up to the individual who can determine that. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned earlier. I'm going to backtrack that Celine is in your top four of favorite singers. Correct? She's by far my. I, I get beat up for saying this all the time. She's my number one over Whitney Houston. She okay. always is. She always was. And I love Whitney, but Celine is just my my top tier. Okay. You know, for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. Now, did you happen to catch the documentary on Amazon Prime that she did? I did. I did. I, I low key cried. I ain't gonna lie. I did. I did. Yeah. It was sad. Yeah, it was because sad. that lady ain't do nothing to nobody. <laughs> like to be honest, she's one of the few artists in the world that don't deal. She like she goes home and does her job, and that's it. Like she never. There was no controversy behind her. She ain't falling out the clubs. She was like she goes on stage, does her job, loves her family, and then you know embraces her audience, and then goes home. And that's what I want to do. Like I don't. I don't want to get caught up in the culture and the lifestyle. She 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 was never. She was the perfect example of how to do it, really, to be right. honest with you. Yeah, and what struck me when watching it, I was like, knowing that vocally she can do pop in the ballads easy, I'm like, the labels must have missed where they probably could have had her go the Mariah route if they wanted to, because I think she could have did R&B as easy. Well, I mean, you know what it is? It's, 
her voice is very unique. She has a certain textured sound to her vocals. So it's like, you got to know where to place the artist when it comes to their vocals. That everybody can, just because you sing it doesn't mean you belong in a particular genre. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Because mm -hmm. she sounds really good, but her and Mariah Carey has two, the, their voices are like, they're, they're two separate vocals, even though they can both carry songs in the best ways possible. Like, um, like Patti LaBelle had a song before Celine Dion and Patti LaBelle was R&B and killed the song. And then all of a sudden, two years later, Celine Dion had the same song. And I didn't even know Patti LaBelle had it before her because Celine sang it so well and did it, mm. you know? So, you know, Celine Dion can cover other people's songs and do a good job with it. She did it with Whitney's songs and made it sound her own, but just as good. I wouldn't say as great as hers, but she carries her own. It's like, I like the fact that you could be in your own lane and still mm -hmm. strive. And that's what I like with the fusion that I'm doing because why would I put myself into a genre, in a particular genre when I can create something new, drive in my own lane and have no traffic? Right. True. No congestion. I believe the song you're referring to is If You Ask Me To, which was originally done by Patti LaBelle, covered by Celine Dion, written by Diane Warren. Yeah, and that pissed me off low-key as a person that writes their own music because it makes that that's what made me really want to safeguard certain things because it's like, if you don't write your own songs sometimes, because there's nothing wrong with not writing your own music, but it's like you can just take it and give it to whoever you want. And, you know, when you put a stamp of a seal on a song and make it something in the industry or leave a print on it, you want that to be what the artist is. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And and that's what that's what really hurt because, you know, like what's love got to do with it wasn't originally for Tina Turner, but she put a stamp on it and made it hers. And now whoever did it before her was a group in, in Europe or some Australian group or something. And now they're, they're lost in history because they ain't got nothing to do. That song doesn't leave it with them. It's the same thing with Angel of Mine of Monica. There was a girl group that originally performed it and I think did well in the European market, but because Monica made it so impactful, those girls are lost in the wind now because it's no longer theirs. So I believe in writing your own music because no one can take it away from you. You have to be the person to sign it over to mm -hmm. do whatever you want to do with it. And that's it. You know, so that's where that comes in. Yeah, you're talking about um the UK group Buck Fizz. They originally did What's Love Got to Do With It. And then what happened was they heard Tina's version. They're like, nope, we can't release that. So they scrapped it. And then Angela Mine was originally cut by the UK girl group Eternal. And then, of yes. course, Monica made it a worldwide smash. There we go. Right. And the point that I'm making is, it's like, and nobody's saying they didn't do a good job with it, but, you know, Every artist's dream is to have a staple or a signature song that they want the world to remember them by. You know, you want to create your own legacy. You want timeless music. You know, the money is good for the trend and the vibe then and there. You buy a house, buy a car, show off, do whatever. But you want something longevity. Like, we all low-key, no matter how much we try to show off for social media, we want something that's going to be impactful and that's going to be remembered in the industry that people can identify us with. And everybody, and I feel like every major artist that we all you know, love that we find icons that we stabilize mm -hmm. or have a signature song that we can identify or two. It doesn't have to be a number one hit, but it's their staple platform song. Right. You definitely, at the end of the day, I feel want to be a legacy act. But if you are that legacy act, you kind of don't want to rest on your laurels and be able to put out new content, just like LL Cool J. He just recently dropped a brand new album. Then Common and Pete Rock dropped their album, Rakim drop the album and you know you kind of want to be able to see hmm how can I adapt my sound to be relevant but not at the same time trace trend trends and not get bored with the fact that I can just as easy go on the tour just perform my old hits yeah like you know I, I mean I, I believe in longevity I do believe in that but you know as the world changes you know, you have to kind of vibe with it too and follow the trends, you know, but that's why people collaborate, you know, that's why I did also take the time across genres and collaborate with a Latin artist, you know, Richie Boy, and for some reason I became, you know, I'm at the Mexican Music Awards now, all of a sudden, now performing live on their stage and being honored and awarded International Artist of the Year, some kid from the Bronx, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, the end, well, correction, it's the NY, um, you know, Premios Cuperos, um Mexican Music Awards, not the one in Mexico officially, but my song uh, that I un that was unreleased got leaked into like the Latin record pool, one of the biggest Latin DJ record pools, which I didn't know DJs had their own little record pools where they 
share music with and mm-hmm. and I realized, you know what? Let me go that route. You know, I love social media. I love Spotify, iTunes, but the DJs are the ones that are playing music in the clubs. They're the mm-hmm. ones setting the tone. You know, the ra- radios is, radios and guys like you and this jockeys and vloggers, you guys are not out of style. You guys still create and break artists and still make trends. So as long as you guys exist, like you guys can create the next new superstar and the next new act. Mm-hmm. So I feel like giving you guys our music and letting you play it, it, it turned into a thing because that's what happened with one of my songs that I haven't even released yet. Next thing you know, I'm on a countdown chart. Oh yeah. And the one thing I like now with everybody being more accepting of there's no labels as far as genre, no label as far as style, that it's just music. Whereas 20, 30 years ago, if you had an act coming in from a international fan base and country you had to make an album that would cater to the u.s market whereas now that's not the case you know bad bunny is selling out performing straight spanish and it's being well received and played on radio where well, we're connected more on the social media wise we're connected more and we're open and, the, and this generation is a little bit more open that's why I, I wasn't scared to do the fusion vibe you know like i gotta you know i'm I want to say I, I bought it in first or whatever. I don't know history-wise if there's another artist that did it because going mainstream is not the same thing, but I do feel like I want to be one of the first artists to kind of put the pop and dance all together and kind of create something. But I, I'm i more of a performance artist, more so, you know, like I said, I'm not so much a vocalist. I'm I'm a, I'm a singer, but I'm not a vocalist. I'm, I'm an entertainer. I perform on stage live. I create good music that people could dance and jump around and enjoy or enjoy watching visually and i do have a few slow songs as well you know you know i got the vocals where i do do sing and express mm-hmm. myself and i like how i feel when i do that as well but overall i just i love to perform that's just my 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 thing right and uh what are some current projects that you're working on um my current project that i'm working on is um uh Moves Don't Stop, The Ground of an Indie Artist, Season 2. A lot of people don't know this, but I have my own television show on Cablevision. Um, Ten episodes uh, were released. Uh, they were on the Bronx Net. So if you have Verizon, Fios, or Optimum Online, you can go online and watch them. And, you know, the local stations, they replay them every now and then. Um, I'm working on a docu-series, a doc- not a docu-series, but a documentary of my life um, in regards to what goes on behind the scenes musically about artists trying to make it and struggle. So I'm working with Alan Carlton and a few other producers. Uh, he's, you know, he um is a, a indie film director and he, he won a few indie awards or whatever. And he works with a lot of, um a lot of, he worked with a lot of hip hop artists in the scene, especially the boy group Shy, if you remember them, uh, very close friends with them and members of their group as well. Uh, most of my projects I wrapped up for the year besides possibly doing a Christmas show or two. And I might have one fashion show before the year's over, but I'll promote that um, once I get the dates. But I did most of my shows already for the year besides a listening party that'll possibly be coming up in November and a, a, a online Christmas concert, which I'll probably be doing as well. Okay, all right, staying booked, busy, and blessed. That's how the best thing's supposed to be. Now, before we conclude the interview, uh, any shout-outs you want to give and plug your socials? Um, www.gaminganthony.com. Everything is connected on there. Um, Gaming Anthony Official for TikTok. Uh, Damien Anthony official for Instagram, Damien Anthony on Facebook. Everything is pretty much Damien Anthony or the official Damien Anthony YouTube. Move Don't Stop uh, was released August 30th. It's on YouTube now. Uh, please subscribe and follow. Shout out to DJ Mike Boogie, my official DJ, DJ Sweet Tea, the DJ Melanin Twins. Shout out, you know, to Calvin Stevens, who's, um, he's, a, he's playing an integral part in guiding me in this music industry, you know, with, with his team and they're trying to help me, um, Shoot for the stars, you know. Shout out to Randy Connor, who I mentioned. Shout out to my dancers, um, Shiran, Dante, and Emiko. Emiko is from Japan, you know, she tears it up. And, you know, Shiran, she's from Israel. Shout out to her. She's doing her thing. Um, open invite to any dancers, you know, just send an email to Damien Anthony UMX at gmail.com if you want to be a part of, you know, working with me and dancing with me because I am working with dancers. And I would love look to. I'm looking for more paid gigs, you know, 
sometimes paid rehearsals and um you know just let's chase the dream and not the competition all right and you can catch this interview wherever you stream podcasts and on youtube at youtube.com slash beyond the album cover ladies and gentlemen let's give a big thank you round of applause for pop reggae dancehall artist damian anthony thank you for coming on to beyond the album cover and you're more than welcome to come back anytime Thank you so much. You're welcome and you're always invited to come to a show and check out behind the scenes and do anything you want. For sure, definitely.